let's get this going. So uh, we're looking at the neuromuscular system today, which means we're going to be kind of talking about how our brain interacts with our muscular system, right? So um, we'll be getting a little, we're going to get a little bit into muscles today, um, but we're mostly going to be looking at like how the nervous system zaps the muscular system. Um, so for instance, we're going to be looking a little bit at um, what's called a sodium potassium pump. That's how your nervous system is able to create like electric charge. Uh, and we'll sort of like break down how that works. And then we will look at like how that action potential interacts with our muscles. And then your muscles actually generate their own action potential so that like that electric charge can travel throughout the entire muscle itself. Um, so we're not going to get, I mean, we will talk a little bit about like the difference between like type one and type two fibers as well. Uh, but we won't go super far in depth into that just because that's something that's related a little bit more into the training, like, you know, like what do you do to result in one versus the other? Um, so uh, let's go ahead and dive in. So our learning objectives today, we want to describe the role of your central nervous system uh, and also your peripheral nervous system. So we got to look at how those two things work. Uh, we're going to uh, explain the specifics of the neuromuscular junction. Like I said, that is where your nervous system interacts with your muscular system. We'll look at the organizational makeup of our skeletal muscles, AKA um, how they are organized, like ver you know, one version versus another version, uh, how muscle contractions actually work, and then we will dive a little bit into the different types of muscle fibers. So um, muscles, obviously, like the big thing that we need to remember is that like your muscles are under the control of your nervous system, right? So your nervous system determines like when a muscular contraction happens. We're going to call that an excitation contraction coupling. And what that means is like your nervous system excites your muscles, which causes a contraction. Those things work together. Um, so your nervous system is really in charge of like making the movement happen. Um, and then your muscular system is in charge of like executing that movement. Um, so obviously like an injury can affect uh, your muscular system pretty easily. Like we can track that pretty simply, you know? Um, uh, you could pull a muscle, you could get hit really hard during a, a sports or athletic event. Um, you know, any of those versions is going to affect how a muscle works, but that also involves like your central and peripheral nervous systems, right? Like if you are altering like how you move that muscle and you're babying that muscle a little bit, then your nervous system sort of loses its ability to interpret like what position that muscle's in and how it's supposed to properly execute movements. This is one of the reasons why like it always kind of surprises people, but ankle sprains can often lead to glute weakness in that same side, right? And if you think about it, it's because like when you see somebody and they're walking with like a, a sprained ankle, they're doing that thing where they're just not putting very much weight on it, right? So now this leg is like taking all of this like grunting and then like this leg's really not, you know, performing hip extension. So the glute, you know, doesn't really perform as much hip extension. So it loses that ability. Then there's also like a little bit of lateral flexion at the spine. Um, my, uh, my teacher for Kinesis actually, I feel like this is something like every college professor does if they are, you know, if they're a certain age. <laughs> um, mine was relatively young. Uh, but she, she wrote her, 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 her thesis when she was in college, like, in, or like or her, her, her research paper to get like her master's um, was on how uh, sprained ankles on like your right leg or on your left leg can lead to a shoulder impingement syndrome on the contralateral leg. So like if you have like a right sprained ankle, it can sometimes lead to shoulder impingement on the upper side, uh, upper opposite side. And that's like, you wouldn't think like at first glance that like a, an ankle would have anything to do with the opposite shoulder. But if you look at like how things travel up your body, usually things tend to switch sides in terms of like how your body responds uh, once you get to the waist, you know? Uh, like if you have a lot of like tilting in the bottom, you'll have a lot of like rounding up top and that's all just to kind of keep the Jenga stack <laughs> evenly distributed. But it was kind of an interesting like thing to think about, you know, is, um, you know, any injury is going to affect like your entire kinetic chain because all of it is like one interdependent system. So that's really a big thing that we're going to be kind of focusing on today, right? Um, and so, you know, again, like the, one of the things we need to remember is like when we talk about like movements, right, there's a lot of things going in to actual movement. There's a lot of individual little steps that need to come together in order to create effective movement. Um, so 
for the record, by the way, we're gonna, it's gonna be a little while before we get into any specific notes. This is going to, this PowerPoint really it does like a lot of like, um, I mean, we wanna know the heck out of the nervous system, but this is like a lot of brain stuff in the beginning, which, uh, you know, we wanna have a basic understanding of, but it's not something that you're ever tested on. Like, um, it goes a little bit more in depth than it needs to. Like, we, we much more care about like nerves than we care about the brain itself. And I know that seems kind of silly because the brain is so very important, but it's just not something that we like directly, like those types of tissues is not something that we necessarily work on directly. So um, it's going to be a little while before we get any any specific notes here. But one of the things we're going to look at uh, is what's called your pre uh, pre central gyrus uh, or gy or uh, gyrus, uh, and it's located in the front of the central sulcus, uh, and that forms like the the back border of your frontal lobe. So um, this is one of like this is where a lot of like your motor movements happen, right? It's right in here and right in here, and so most of this front part of your brain is in charge of like deciding what movements to make and then this section right here which is your primary motor cortex is really in charge of like voluntary movement this is where like uh, your somatic nervous system kind of gets all of its signals from so when you look at like the architecture of like how your brain is comprised uh, when we look at the architecture of like your nervous system it is very 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 complex because different parts of your brain kind of control different parts of your body this is why uh, if you've ever seen like somebody who has like a stroke it can manifest itself in like a lot of different ways right a stroke is is a limited blood supply to the brain which results in limited oxygen supply and limited oxygen supply means the cells inside the brain can't breathe and they suffocate and unfortunately die. Um, and so that's sort of what happens during a stroke and that can sometimes manifest in the most common way that we see, which is like paralyzation. Like that's the one that's very easy for us to see. Like sometimes you'll see like the side of somebody's face light if it's like one side or another of their brain um, that had that stroke or you will see um, but uh, you'll see like somebody who like can't move certain parts of their body, they can't feel certain parts of their body. Um, but a lot of times it can result in a lot of other things as well. Like it can be emotional sometimes. Um, there's a really, really fascinating story about, and it was uh, really ironic actually, because like it was a neurology um, scientist, like a, a specifically like studied the brain, but she had a stroke. Uh, and it was very fascinating because like, she couldn't like the parts of her brain that were able to recognize like what someone's role was uh were d damaged and so like her doctors and stuff would come in and she wouldn't recognize them and she wouldn't know who they were and she'd see like white lab coats and it was a very like scary thing and it would reset every time she had like also like limited memory and so like every time her doctors came in she would have this kind of panic fear where she was like who are these people what do they want but then like inevitably like um a doctor or a nurse or somebody would like place like a hand on her leg or like her shoulder or something to like comfort her and make her feel better and immediately like the emotional part of her brain would light up and go oh this is somebody who cares about me and so like you know the very logical side of her brain was was damaged and the very emotional side of her brain sort of kicked into overdrive to kind of make up for that so your brain's a pretty fascinating interesting thing um but obviously when we're talking about things, uh, we are looking at like how it helps us produce like movements, right? So the neurology of movement is, is obviously like at the center of understanding how our body actually does move. But we understand like how our nervous system functions. We are going to have a deeper understanding of like why kin kinesthetically we move the way that we move. Um, so in your nervous system, you have a ton of mitochondria. <laughs> uh, they are distributed all throughout like your nervous system, but they are also highly, highly distributed throughout your muscular system. And that's because both of these systems are incredibly energy hungry systems, right? So your nervous system definitely needs to be able to produce ATP on the go. Uh, we'll look at why in just a little bit, but in its most basic, ATP is what allows you to move sodium and potassium ions against their concentration gradients, which creates electricity, right? Um, so that's obviously a very important role of our nervous system because your nervous system uses those electric signals. And then we have your muscular system, which obviously uses a lot of ATP because that's what we use in order to create like actin and myosin bridges that create muscular contractions. So when we're looking at, uh, I'll, I'll put a little, let's get a little something in here. Uh, if we're looking at the neurology of movement, right? Uh, we know that like the nervous system 
is going to control the muscular system uh, through a series of electric, what we call action potentials. Right? And basically what that means is like, your nervous system zaps your muscular system and your muscular system goes, Ooh, and it contracts. Um, so that's essentially what is happening here. And so when we look at it, like within a muscle, and unfortunately this PowerPoint uh, doesn't really break down, uh, it doesn't go super into like actin and myosin fibers, which I do want to do a really quick um, review of. And I skipped too far and I lost myself. Where am I? There I am. Okay. <laughs> um, so really quickly, like, let's look at those myofibrils again inside of our, our muscular system, right? So inside a muscle, right, you are going to have uh, myo, uh, myofilaments, right? And those myofilaments are specialized proteins that are able to bind to each other in order to create a muscular traction. I wonder actually, I, we got pretty lucky. Yesterday, I, I've never done this before, but I looked up the, the heart GIF and it was just a really quick way. I wonder if I can see actin, myosin, GIF. Um, see the sliding filament model in action. Yeah, look at that, that's pretty freaking good. Um, so when you see it, these are like different proteins, right? Like this is basically your protein of myosin here. It's the thick filament, right? And we call it's thicker because like, obviously this is a really big strand, but we also see like it's got all these little heads on it. And like those little heads are basically what's reaching up and they're grabbing and pulling this guy this way. And they're pulling this one this way. And what's happening is like the muscle is being drawn in and shortened. So like these fibers are happening here. The same thing is happening in all kinds of different fibers, like simultaneous. Oh, okay, that one's a little long. Man, I might start doing this gift thing more often. That's pretty great. Uh, but you can see like it's starting to bunch up, right? And that's why like when you go from a position like this and you go to a position like this, you can see your muscle shorten and bunch up. And that's because some of the slider uh, fibers are sliding this way and some of the fibers are sliding this way. Um, so those are your myofilaments, right? So on your myofilaments, just as a quick review here, we've got your actin, uh, which is the thin filament that has binding sites that myosin wants to bind to, okay? And then we have myosin, which is the thick filament with uh, that houses uh, club like heads that attach to actin, okay? Actin, we'll say actin's binding sites. So your thin filament has all these like slots on it and the thick filament has all these heads that insert into the slot and pull. Uh, but we don't want that to always happen, right? We need to be able to like get myosin to let go uh, and relax a little bit and allow that muscle to get back to full length. So we also have regulatory proteins, troponin and, whoa, and tropomyosin, which are regulatory proteins that, ah, that block actin's uh, binding sites during a relaxation uh, of a muscle, right? So their job is to like get in the way. Um, so that's all well and good. I think we've got a pretty good understanding. This whole process, by the way, um, is called the sliding filament theory or sliding filament model, depending on who you ask, <laughs> right? Um, which is, uh, describes the actin and myosin cross bridging. Okay, so uh, this is a, an example of what we call actin and myosin cross bridging, right? Um, and so like those cross bridges, in order for that like, to occur, like in order for actin to have enough, like, uh, I'm sorry, in order for myosin to have enough energy to reach up and bind with that um, actin strand, myosin has to burn up a little bit of ATP. 
So this does take a little bit of energy in order to occur. occur. And so that's what we're seeing right here. So how do we know, you know when to release that energy, right? Like what triggers the release of that energy? Well, that's where your nervous system comes in, right? So at the nervous system, your nervous system's job is to uh, basically break off a little of its own ATP, create and use that ATP to switch the concentrations of sodium and potassium. And sodium and potassium are what we call electrolytes, right? Um, electrolytes are charged ions. So if we look at, actually, I'm going to gif it up again. This is like my new favorite tool. Uh, it's like so much better than me trying to find videos of all this crap. Uh, let's see here. Action potential uh, gif. <laughs> oh my God. I've been doing this for years and I found a new thing. Uh, <laughs> this is so great. So you can see here, right? Um, this is actually how your body is pumping, you know, sodium and potassium from one side to another, right? And you can actually see right here, this is the amount of charge that's present, right? So like the amount of charge, once it's being pumped, the amount of charge decreases, but like once it gets to a certain potential, obviously it's gonna be really, really high. Uh, and that's, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think negative 40 millivolts. So there's like, you can see all the different ions here, right? These are, that's a bunch of sodium, that's a bunch of calcium, that's a bunch of potassium. And so you have these pumps that push sodium and potassium in different directions. And they have different amounts of electrons in them. So because of that different amounts of electrons, that generates electricity because now you have a whole bunch of electrons over here and very little electrons over here and those electrons are like oh god i want to get back to my friends and like they get really charged up and that creates a, an electric signal right that's literally how um batteries work i know that i i was like planning on this today and i was like i put batteries over here that they are because <laughs> i was going to show this as an example so if you've got two batteries and you're putting them in your remote right um, if I were to take two batteries and I put them in my remote like that, that is not going to do anything, right? Like that does not supply my remote with any electricity because I've got all my positive stuff over here on this one. And I've got all my positive stuff over here on this one. And I've got all my negative stuff over here on this one. I've got my negative stuff over here on this one. So there's only positive and only negative. There's no ability, for, there's no reason for those electrons to want to go from one side to another. But... So that is basically a muscle at rest. That's a, neur that's a neuron not zapping a muscle. But if I go like this, and then I put it in my remote control, right? Now my remote has power, right? Now I can use it to turn my TV on and off. Um, so this now has positive over here and negative over here. And it has negative over here and positive over here. I have switched them. So what's happening when I like connect metal to both sides is like, and that creates like a closed circuit, is now like those electrons, they're bouncing back and forth like this. They're rushing from side to side, pushing against each other whenever they are like, you know, whenever there's a signal to create an electric charge. So basically that rushes electricity from one place to another. That rushing of electricity is exactly what's happening here, right? When I move sodium and potassium, I'm flipping the battery. And so that creates charge. And then it's gonna travel from every single one of my neurons. It's gonna go from neuron to neuron to neuron to neuron to neuron, and that electricity is gonna travel down. And eventually it's going to what we do call, what we call, um, it's gonna do what we call uh, innervate the muscle. It's gonna innervate the muscle, it's gonna zap the muscle. And then the muscle is gonna create its own action potential, which will do the exact same thing. So I kinda of wanna show, yeah, there we go, look at this. And this is a, please be an actual GIF. Yeah, see this? Like that's basically the batteries flipping, right? They're all positive on the outside and negative on the inside, but you can see this is traveling in this direction. So you've got all these little pumps inside of your cells uh, and those pumps are little proteins actually, and they push sodium and potassium in either direction. But obviously like sodium and potassium like don't wanna go in those directions. So that takes a lot of energy, right? And that energy that it takes is created by burning up a little bit of ATP. So this is where ATP and action potentials really come together. And here you can see, I'm just going gift crazy now. Here you can see like, <laughs> you know, it's gonna travel down like the dendrites of a neuron to the body of the neuron, and then it will get to, you know, travel down the axon, and then it branches into all these little branches. Those little branches are what, like, a, you know, grab a muscle cell. Um, 
oh, here's one where they're all together. Yeah, you can see like we're just constant. Wow, that's kind of weird. Uh, oh, I see what they're doing. They're they're yeah showing it travel down. So you can see like it is literally going to travel down that tail, and then this tail end is going to insert onto a muscle cell and zap that muscle cell. All right, I could do this all day. <laughs> this is uh, so cool. Got to get oh off God. these gifts yeah it is cool right like i love yeah. talking about it. the nervous system is like my favorite system to talk about because it's insane that all of this occurs you know um and it's so cool because like remember mitochondria is this really responsible for producing massive amounts of atp so mitochondria give our nervous system the energy uh to be able to do this right and mitochondria aren't even like organelles that we originally started with they were like a bacteria that an animal cell at some point in the history of the universe ate <laughs> and then decided not to digest. <laughs> like, it was just like, I'm going to eat this thing. That thing is, that thing's really good at producing it. You know what? I'm not going to digest it. <laughs> and then like the back, the, the mitochondria was like, well, this is great. I'm in a little bubble and I can't be hurt. You know, <laughs> it's like, I'm going to produce energy for this little guy all day, you know, like, and it just survived and, and, you know, led throughout things so I, yeah, I love the nervous system it's so 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 fun um so during a contraction right during a muscular contraction each myosin cross bridge will break down a molecule of atp and when that happens right atp uh which we remember like uh i'm gonna gif it up again atp uh <laughs> um is is where you uh break off that phosphate right so you'll have um you know a molecule of adenosine and three little phosphates. And when you kick that phosphate off, you're left with a whole bunch of energy because anytime you like break a chemical bond, energy is gonna get released, you know? It's like you're breaking the universe a little bit, the universe makes an explosion. Uh, <laughs> and so like uh, what that does is that actually um, allows you to have this myosin cross bridge. Now again, I already know that I'm drunk with power here, but check it out. This is actually just the I, I, my internet search history knows what I'm looking for. So that's actually what's happening right there. Oh, actually going back to this real quick, because I forgot. Um, ATP, once, you know, it's adenosine triphosphate because there are three phosphates, so tri for three. But when you break off that third phosphate, you are left with what's called ADP or adenosine diphosphate, di for two. So take a look here. You can see you got ADP and that little phosphate that it broke off. It'll burn up its energy, which creates the muscular contraction. And then when the next ATP molecule attaches, that's actually what gets the muscle to relax. So what's weird is like, you know, um, the ATP burns, I'll move this out of the way. ATP like burns up its energy in order to create the contraction. Um, but you guys might remember me saying, uh, one, of the, one of the weird things about how proteins work Whenever something binds to a protein, protein likes to change shape. Um, anytime something like binds to a protein, it encourages proteins to like change their shape. And so when an ATP molecule binds to that little myosin head, uh, it releases uh, and goes back into its resting position. Meanwhile, there's some other stuff that's actually putting those little chaperones that block the binding sites, that troponin and tropomyosin. There's some stuff that's also flushing out uh, the things that allow them to attach as well. And so that happens like simultaneously, and that's how you're able to relax your muscles. So we'll try and do this at the right time when it resets. So you've got a molecule of ADP and a phosphate. It burnt off that phosphate. Uh, right, which then gives it a bunch of energy. It uses that energy to create a contraction. And when the next ATP molecule binds, it relaxes back to its neutral position. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. <laughs> You're like, uh, it makes sense. Uh, <laughs> I understand all the steps, but how yeah. the hell does it actually happen? <laughs> yeah, right? mm -hmm. I'm just in shock of how quickly this actually mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I understand the process and right now it's going really slow you know but to put in perspective how quick like when you're doing box jumps and when you're you know right. lifting, when you're running and when you're you know all these things it's this process is going so fast you know totally yeah think about like how quick a thought is right think about like how fast like you think of something mm -hmm. um you know what have you ever i don't know if you've ever been in like well, I mean, you, you're like a boxer, but I don't know if anybody else has ever been in like some type of like situation where maybe something bad is happening, like like a car accident or 
or like, you know, like somebody swerving out of their lane, your brain goes and it makes like a thousand calculations in a microsecond, you know? Um, and like all this stuff and like, you know, rushes into your brain. Yeah, it's incredibly fast. And I mean, you think about like how quickly electricity can travel, you know, look at like a, like a lightning strike, you know, like um, that is like how fast all of this stuff occurs. Um, yeah, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly fast. Um, which is just so awesome, you know? <laughs> uh, and what's cool is we can actually train to make it faster. You know, the more we train in a, in a way that encourages speed, the faster we actually become. We actually, um, this is what's kind of cool. Uh, and one thing when we're talking about the nervous system that's important to remember, this is electricity, right? Have you guys ever been like electrocuted? Have <laughs> you ever been shocked? <laughs> no, oh man, it sucks. <laughs> it sucks so bad. <laughs> it is like one of my least favorite things to ever happen. Uh, the worst I've ever been electrical, and I'll never forget this. When I was working at my parents' pet store as a kid, um, we used to have these chrome domes, and that's what you use to like heat lizards and snakes and stuff. Uh, and it's this like big light with, you know, and it just heats the whole thing up. And you usually put a rock underneath it, which gets really hot, and the lizard can climb up there if it wants to or cool down by crawling off of it. Anyway. Uh, those things are, you know, the light bulb is just kind of sitting in this dome. And so like, you know, when you're moving around, it's pretty easy to break the bulb. Uh, and at one point I did that and I was like, oh, and I like shattered it. So I was like, crap. And then I couldn't like grab the light bulb and like unscrew it. So I went and got like a pair of like needle nose pliers. Um, now hold on, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> uh, cause yeah, of course, of course, touching like a light bulb with pliers is stupid, but I made sure this light bulb was plugged into the wall, which was plugged to like a light switch. And I turned the, the, the thing off and I turned the light switch off, but I did not unplug the thing. Cause I, I took two steps to keep from getting it. And immediately my, he was like my, uh, a kind of a godfather figure comes in and is like, why are these lights off? And he like flipped the switch. And I'm like, kuh, 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 kuh. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I'm going to kill you. And it was, I was so, like, <laughs> I was all amped up and, freaking out. I was like, oh. <laughs> um, but also at the same time, what was interesting is like the pliers, um, you know, there was like rubber on those pliers. I shouldn't have, you know, really been all that electric, but I was touching like some of the metal part of it, which conducts electricity really well. Um, and that conducting of electricity heats up the metal. And I remember having to like kind of peel some rubber off of my skin uh, because it melted so quickly. And that's the thing about electricity. It's really, you know, like this is, this is, it's still really, 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 really hot. If you ever look at like, uh, if you ever Google pictures of like somebody who's been struck by lightning, they'll have these really interesting looking scars and it's because they got burned. It's extremely hot. Um, so here's the thing. This is why I bring this up, by the way, this, this all has a point. Uh, your nervous system is using a series of these signals, right? And if we look at like how it's traveling from like, the head of the neuron down to the body down the tail and then it maybe attaches to another neuron right and travels down those fingers into the body into the tail into the next fingers into the body into the tail right like that's traveling from neuron to neuron to neuron to neuron to neuron until eventually it gets where it's going right i create a signal in my brain it goes to my spine travels down and then once it gets to the correct disc it'll travel off and go to whatever muscle I'm choosing to contract. So that is a series of electricity, which actually, in a way, damages your nervous system and actually burns the cells up a little bit. And so it creates this kind of burned in groove. Now, that's actually a good thing because now that it's kind of burnt in, it encourages that next electric signal to travel down the same route. It travels down the exact same path. It's more likely to go into the grooved area. I always pull up this picture. I always try to pull up this picture, but it's like, this is classic, like freaking human beings here. Uh, let's see here, paved path versus uh, grass. <laughs> um, I try, I can't remember how I Google this, but I always look this up. Uh, worn in grass uh, path. Oh man, come on. I <laughs> Yeah, there. Wait. Is that a game? That's a game. 
Uh, that's what I'm looking for. I mean, you can see obviously like this is worn in. This is the common place where somebody is like taking carts and stuff. But I'm trying to find this like um, worn in grass versus walkway. <laughs> ah, look at this. This is classic human beings right here. Like, we have a paved path that we are supposed to take, but people are so lazy, they just go straight through the grass. And I'm one of these people, by the way. <laughs> like, I know this about myself. I'm like, that's inefficient. And I go through the grass. <laughs> uh, and that's like, <laughs> it creates this kind of worn in thing. This is kind of like your nervous system. So maybe you created your first initial, you know, your body trying to learn how to walk, but then your body found a much more efficient way to learn how to walk and it got better and better and better at it over time and now walking is not something that we consider to be very hard you know we're all really good at walking right we're adults um but like when your nervous system was fresh it tried a million different ways to figure out how to walk it was like should i go from that neuron to that neuron to that neuron i was like no it didn't really work we fell down what if we go from that neuron to that neuron to that neuron and eventually like it's like that was a good path and so it burns it in deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper that's what muscle memory is. It's literal physical, physical changes. Um, if anybody in here, if anybody in this call wants to kind of learn a little bit more about this concept separately, uh, this is gonna sound kind of weird, but there's, there's this channel on YouTube that is really funny. Um, and it's called Movie Theory. Uh, or, and they have, they have another one called Game Theory. And, they, and what it is, is it's this guy who's like crazy good at just all types of science. And what he does is he breaks down like a theory behind like why things are the way they are. It's like, could Jedi's ever actually exist? And it's like, he breaks down, you know, the science behind it. It's like in this movie with like portals, would it be possible for a portal to ever actually exist? So he breaks down like physics and biology and, and chemistry and all these different things. He breaks down, if, if anybody knows anything about like the Marvel movies, you've got this Deadpool character, right? Who is this character who, regenerates very easily, you know, Brian Reynolds and like he can't be killed because his cells regenerate so fast. Um, can Deadpool uh, movie theory. And so this right here, this video, how to kill Deadpool <laughs> um, is actually a really interesting article and it breaks down how your nervous system actually works. You'll see, hear these stories about people who have like, you know, this one guy got a javelin through his eye and it literally like pierced his entire brain, but he didn't die. He survived. And a lot of his brain was damaged. It completely changed his personality. He had to learn how to walk again, but he did do all those things. It changed everything about him, but he learned how to like officially walk uh, and do all this other stuff as well because his nervous system found new paths to get to those muscles. It found a new way to kind of do it. Um, and that's what's like really fascinating here as well. And so that video actually breaks down. It's like, could you ever actually kill Deadpool? And the, in the end it goes, not really, but what you could do is you could damage his brain enough uh, that he would become a new person basically. Um, fun videos, by the way, if you ever want to get super nerdy, uh, watch those videos, they're great. <laughs> So, all right, let's get back. So during a contraction, ATP is broken down into ADP, uh, and that energy is used to create the sliding filament model, right? So uh, we'll put this down here. ATP is broken down uh, to release energy, which triggers the sliding action in the sliding filament model, okay? All right. So now we're gonna kind of get into the regions of the brains. We're gonna move past this pretty quick. Um, but you have got like your motor cortexes and sensory cortexes. Sensory cortexes are also really important. Like this back part of your brain uh, is in charge of like sensing information. <clears throat> So like, obviously, you know, movement is a response to, to some type of sensory information. Like we move in response to whatever information we get. If you touch a hot stove, your body goes, whoa, move your arm back, right? Like that's, you sense that, the that it is hot enough to create damage and so you, you triggered a motor response um, in response. <laughs> uh, so that is uh, kind of what's happening there. So different parts of your brain that are somewhat relevant to us, right? We've got our cerebrum, which is a large part of the brain. It's in the, the front part and then also like um, 
in your brain stem. It's got two main hemispheres here and its job is to like regulate all that sensory information, right? Uh, then we've also got your cerebellum. This has got a lot of your neurons actually. This is kind of interesting. Your cerebellum um, is this kind of tiny part of your brain, right? It's not very large, but it's got most of your neurons in it, which is pretty fascinating. Uh, its job is to like help process information. So like when we look at like sensory information, we gather it and then once we have sensory information our brain interprets it it's like it's like hey brain we just touched something really hot and the brain goes how hot and it's like i don't know like 200 degrees and the brain goes all right well i know that 100 degrees is safe it'll hurt a little bit but it's not really all that dangerous 200 degrees that's really dangerous we should move the arm away right like its job is to like consider the information interpret and execute and then it you know wants to do the appropriate response and that's where um your motor uh, cortex comes in, right? Your motor cortex will then like move it away. So your your uh, your sensory cortex will, you know, uh, sense information. Your motor motor cortex uh, will uh, execute responses, and your cerebellum will um, uh, consider what actions to take. Uh, then you get your medulla oblongata. Uh, that's this section right back here. And your medulla is in charge of like all of your autonomic functions. So all the stuff that's like kind of automatic that you don't really have a lot of control over. Um, you know, like controlling your digestive system, for instance. That's very much like a medulla thing. Um, so when we look at our nerves, right, you can see like uh, they have all these very interesting branches here. Again, that's really important because like they need to be able to travel down different paths, right? So like if it travels down this main highway here and then splits off at number five, that's a very different signal than splitting off and continuing down number six or going from six and splitting down number seven. You know, this might be something that tastes really good, this might be something that tastes really bitter, and this might be something that tastes really salty, you know? Or maybe this contracts your bicep, that contracts your tricep, and that contracts your quadriceps, you know? Uh, <coughs> good Lord. So that is uh, uh, what we call like a brachial plexus, and it's basically just like a, a network of all these like different nerves uh, that are starting to split off going to, you know, whatever, whatever paths they're going. This is the Amazon shipping site. Uh, <laughs> Oh, holy crap, look at that. Normally these are in bold, that's why I must have, I didn't even see them. So this is, uh, we do see myofilaments here, that's really nice. Um, so myofibrils are composed of like all these proteins, actin, myosin, and other proteins that kind of hold them together. Um, so inside of what we call the sarcomere, and the sarcomere isn't like a physical thing, it's just like an area of like a muscle. So the area of the muscle that allows muscles to contract, we call that the sarcomere, and that's where actin and myosin are creating these cross bridges, right? Um, so actin is a really uh, thin filament, it's a globular protein. It globular meaning it's got little binding sites that are kind of circular. Uh, and they're there to like allow myosin to reach up with its little, with its little heads and interact with that filament. Um, and then uh, we do have inside of a muscle, we are gonna have all of our motor nerves as well, right? Um, so, uh, motor nerves, what they are, we'll call it, we're actually going to call those motor neurons, um, is a term that refers to the neurons located in the nervous system that connect with the peripheral nerves that produce muscle action. Okay, so motor neurons are the neurons that are responsible for zapping your muscles, right? So what you're going to have is you are going to have what's called an excitation contract, no, contraction couplet. That's that word uh, that we saw just a minute ago, right? A coupling, right? Two things binding together. Um, and so you have excitation from the nervous system, which triggers a contraction uh, in the uh, muscle, right? In the muscle cell. Uh, and this is like describing where, um, describes where uh, motor neurons innervate muscle cells, okay? That is also sometimes referred to, if we're actually, if we're referring to like excitation contractions, we're gonna refer to that as like a neuromuscular junction. Again, that is the junction where your nervous system meets your muscular system. So taking a look, you can kind of see a really good picture of this right here, right? You have your overall muscle, 
And then inside of that muscle, you've got all of these big bundles of other muscle fibers. That's called a fascicle. And inside each fascicle, it's made up of individual little tiny muscle fibers, which is a simple name that we use for a muscle cell. Okay, so there's the individual muscle cell. And then when you zoom in on it, you're gonna notice it's, it's kind of zigzaggy, like within the muscle cell, you're gonna see all these different little sarcomeres. So like, there's a sarcomere, there's a sarcomere, there's a sarcomere, and they're all zigzagged along each other. And so when this one pulls, you know, uh, this one still has room to pull and they can kind of slide past each other there. And so then we zoom in again <laughs> and we can see the individual little proteins. There's your actin strand and there's all your little myosin heads. And so this is gonna slide this way on that little zigzag there. Um, so obviously like we go from really big to really, 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 really small. Um, all right, now uh, I do actually wanna show um, sort of what this looks like in layers here. So let's go ahead and look at an individual like muscle fiber. Um, so a muscle, muscle fibers, okay? Um, so a muscle fiber is a term used to describe muscular system cells. Okay, so muscle fibers are muscle cells, right? Um, and they are gonna have like a bunch of different layers. You're gonna actually notice some of these prefixes from yesterday. We were just talking about the different layers of the heart, right? You have the uh, epicardium, you have the myocardium, and you have the endocardium, right? Well, we're gonna see some of those terms again. We have an epimesium, that is the outermost layer uh, of your uh, muscle cell here. Then you have a paramecium, which is a sheath of connective tissue uh, that's breaking it down into individual little tiny pieces. Um, and then you have your endomecium, which is the innermost layer that's actually surrounding the individual muscle cell itself. The endomecium is probably the most important for our purposes, like it's the most important for us to understand. It's the outer layer of your muscle cell. And what's happening at that endomecium in that individual muscle cell is that's actually where electricity is kind of traveling through each individual muscle cell in order to recruit it to create that contraction. So, uh, I mean, obviously all of the layers are important, you know, like you have like this outer layer of fascia, what's really important that like keeps your muscle together and, you know, the grain of the muscle going in the right direction. Um, the uh, the paramecium is obviously all, also really important because that's dividing it into individual components. But the endomecium is really where, when we look at an action potential in a muscle, um, action potential muscle, uh, if we're looking at like how that action potential actually travels through the muscle itself, you can see here, this one doesn't look like a GIF. It is a GIF. All right, uh, there's the neuron, and then that electric signal travels throughout this entire fiber. I and mean, look at this, you can see uh, there's electricity traveling down and it's gonna polarize, and it's gonna zap all those individual fibers, and that's how we recruit that Z line, right? It zaps it, releasing that ATP, and there's this webbing covering the whole thing that we find, and that webbing is what allows you know these different concentrations of other ions to travel. That's what creates that contraction. So the the electricity from the neuron zaps the webbing. The webbing releases all these materials, uh, and those materials cause the actual contraction to occur. So. Maggie, you were amazed at how fast all of this is happening. There's even more stuff that's happening. There's more moving parts. There's more steps. And still, all of this is happening lightning fast, you know? Um, so we're going to go ahead and look at that muscular contraction here, right? Um, uh, okay, so let's look at... Uh, man, we're really just kind of stuck on the neurology of mood. I feel like we should be at another section here, but we're not. Um, so... Uh, inside a muscle, yeah. So now we're gonna look at muscular contractions. Okay, so muscular contractions are uh, when the nervous system interacts with the muscular system to create excitation, contraction, coupling, uh, we are going to experience 
Actually, that that is what that is. Never mind. Um, so this triggers muscular uh, the nervous system triggers muscular contractions. Okay, there we go. So uh, what we're seeing is like when your nervous system will actually interact with your muscular system, that creates a coupling, which creates contractions, which triggers, you know, uh, a muscle to sort of shorten. So we have to have a place, we have to have a place where these two things meet, right? And we have a term for it that's actually very important. It's called the neuromuscular junction. And this is what you're seeing right here. You're seeing a neuron uh, that has traveled down. This is the, the axon. This is the tail end of the neuron, right? There's the axon right there. And then it comes down into these little club-like heads here. Notice how many mitochondria are inside the muscle and how many are in the nervous system, right? Again, these mitochondria are there to produce ATP in order to allow these materials to have enough energy to move around. So this neuron here houses a whole bunch of these little tiny things right here, right? These little tiny things, these are neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are these little chemicals that trigger the break, uh, the electric, the, uh, they are what trigger the, creation of electricity right they trigger like it's like hey break down some atp so we can create electricity and it's like right got it boom atp gets broken down sodium potassium moves boom we zap stuff right so let's take a look at like what this looks like actually i want to show you um two videos uh i want to show you like how we actually create an action potential so action potential all right so here's how action potentials actually work here. Is this the one I want? Yes, it is. Okay. Our first shoe was simple. It was beautiful. It was, as we say, the right amount of nothing. Nobody Everything cares. you did, thought, and felt could be communicated by pushing a button. It'd be like using the world's simplest app, one that just sends out a little ping, always the same volume and length, to communicate everything from it sure is cold in here to I love churros to boy, I sure would like to breathe sometime soon. Well, that is actually exactly how your neurons send all the impulses responsible for every one of your actions, thoughts, and emotions. When a neuron is stimulated enough, it fires an electrical impulse that zips down its axon to its neighboring neurons. But they've only got one signal that they can send, and it only transmits at one uniform strength and speed. What they can vary is the frequency or number of pulses, like this is distinct from this. And your brain can translate these signals, reading them like binary code, organizing them by location, sensation, magnitude, and importance, so that you know the difference between turn up the thermostat and oh my gosh, I'm on fire. That buzz, that nerve impulse, is called the action potential. It's one of the most fundamental aspects of anatomy and physiology, and really life in general. It's happening inside of you right now, and we want to make sure that you understand what all that buzz is about. <laughs> Before we delve into how neurons communicate, we've got to first understand a little bit of our old friend electricity. Basically, think of your body as a sack of batteries. No, I mean, you don't look like a sack of batteries. I'm just saying that your body as a whole is electrically neutral with equal amounts of positive and negative charges floating around, but certain areas are more positively or negatively charged than others. Because opposite charges attract, we need barriers or membranes to keep positive and negative charges separate until we're ready to use the energy that they're attracting. So remember, I'm pretty sure actually he's gonna say my favorite catchphrase, but nature hates gradients, right? <laughs> like nature can't stand it that there's a bunch of positive stuff over here and a bunch of negative stuff over here. It wants these two things neutraled out. If they combine together, we're nice and neutral. So our body keeps cell membranes on like separating these things so that like they're attracted to each other but they can't get to each other but then we would actually have maybe like a little pump right here or maybe like a little hole right here and that will allow stuff to kind of move through from one side to another so if it moves through a hole and then we pump stuff to the other side that's what creates charge and that's what we're describing here separate until we're ready to use the energy that their attraction creates in other words we keep them separated 
to build potential. A battery just sitting on its own has both a positive and a negative end and the potential to release energy, but it doesn't do anything until it's hooked up to a flashlight or a phone or a kid's toy that lets those charges move toward each other, on the way converting electricity into light or sound or children's laughter. In much the same way, each neuron in your body is like its own little battery with its own separated charges. It just needs an event to trigger the action that brings those charges together. If you're thinking that this sounds more like engineering than anatomy, that might not be a bad thing. It might even help to think of your neurons in the same terms an electrician might use. Voltage, for example, is the measure of potential energy generated by separated charges. It's measured in volts, but in the case of your body, we use millivolts because it's a pretty small amount. In a cell, we refer to this difference in charge as the membrane potential. The bigger the difference between the positive and negative areas, the higher the voltage and the larger the potential. And just like there's voltage in your body, there's also current, the flow of electricity from one point to another. The amount of charge in a current is related both to its voltage and its resistance. Resistance is just whatever is getting in the way of the current. Something with a high resistance is an insulator, like plastic, and something with a low resistance is a conductor, metal. Now, when we talk about these concepts in terms of you, we're typically talking about how current indicates the flow of positively or negatively charged ions across the resistance of your cell membranes. And again, these membranes separate the charges, so they're what provide the potential to convert the electricity into something useful. Okay, now that we got Electricity 101 down, let's see how it works inside your nervous system. A resting neuron is like a battery that's sitting in that sack that is you. When it's just sitting there, it's more negative on the inside of the cell relative to the extracellular space around it. The difference is known as the neuron's resting membrane potential, and it sits at around negative 70 millivolts. Where do those charges come from? Outside of a resting neuron, there's a bunch of positive sodium ions floating around, just lingering outside the membrane. Inside, the neuron holds potassium ions that are positive as well, but they're mingled with bigger negatively charged proteins. And since there are more sodium ions outside than there are potassium ions inside, the cell's interior has an overall negative charge. When a neuron has a negative membrane potential like this, it is said to be polarized. Now, these ions didn't just show up in this arrangement on their own. This is all orchestrated by one of the most important bits of machinery in your nervous system, the sodium-potassium pump. This little protein straddles the membrane of the neuron, and there are tons of them all along the axis. For every two potassium ions it pumps into the cell, it pumps out three sodium ions. This creates a difference in the concentration of sodium and potassium, and a difference in charges, making it more positive outside the neuron. This difference is an electrochemical gradient, and you probably know enough about biology by now to know that nature hates gradients. It wants to even out all of those inequalities in concentration and in charge to restore balance. But the only way to even out that gradient is for the ions to pass across the membrane. Thankfully, the sodium-potassium pump isn't the only way in or out of the cell. The membrane is also riddled with ion channels, large proteins that can provide safe passage across the membrane when their respective gates are open. And these gates open and close for different reasons depending on their structure and purpose. Most are voltage-gated channels, which open at certain membrane potentials and close at others. For example, sodium channels in your neurons like to open around negative 55 millivolts. But some others are ligand-gated channels. They only open up when a specific neurotransmitter, like serotonin or a hormone, latches onto it. Then we also have mechanically-gated channels, which open in response to physically stretching the membrane. In any case, when the gates do open, ions quickly diffuse across that membrane down their electrochemical gradient, evening out the concentrations and running away from other positively charged ions. This movement of ions is the key to all electrical events in neurons, and thus is the force behind every single thing we think, do, and feel. Of course, not all of your body's electrical responses are the same, and neither are the flows of ions going in and out of your neurons. If only a few channels open and only a bit of sodium enters the cell, that causes just a little change in the membrane potential in a localized part of the cell. This is called a graded potential. But in order to send long-distance signals all the way along an axon, you need a bigger change, one big enough to trigger those voltage-gated channels. That is an action potential. And your best bet for making that happen is to depolarize that resting neuron. I mean, cause a big enough change in its membrane potential that it'll trigger the voltage-gated channels to open. It all starts with your neuron sitting there at resting state. All of the ion channels are closed, and the inner voltage is resting at negative 70 millivolts. And then, something happens. Some environmental stimulus occurs, say like a spider brushes up against a tiny hair on your knee, triggering those sodium channels to open, increasing the charge inside the membrane. Now the stimulus and the resulting change have to be strong enough to cross a threshold for the true action potential to kick in, and that threshold is about negative 55 millivolts.
stimulus. Remember that number, because this is an all or nothing phenomenon. If the stimulus is too weak and the change doesn't hit that level, it's like a false alarm. The neuron just returns to a crescent state. So kind of like Doc Brown hitting 1.21 gigawatts in the DeLorean once it hits that threshold. You're not going to travel in time, but you are going to see some serious action potential. At that threshold, the lipid-shaded <laughs> sodium channels open, and there are tons of these. So all of the positive sodium ions rush in, making the cell massively depolarized. So much so that it actually goes positive, up to about positive 40 millivolts. This is action potential in action. It's really just a temporary reversal of the membrane potential, a brief depolarization caused by changes in currents. And unlike graded potentials, which are small and localized, an action potential kicks off a biological chain reaction which sends that electrical signal down the axon. Because each of your neurons has lots of voltage-gated sodium channels, so when a few in one area open, that local current is strong enough to change the voltage around them. And that triggers their neighbors, which triggers the voltage around them, and so on down the line. As soon as all that's underway, the process of repolarization kicks in. This time the voltage-gated potassium ion channels open up, letting those potassium ions flow out in an attempt to rebalance the charges. If anything, it goes too far at first, and the membrane briefly goes through hyperpolarization. Its voltage drops to negative 75 or so millivolts before all of the gate flows and the sodium-potassium bumps take over and bring things back to their resting level. Now, when part of the axon is in the middle of all this and its ion channels are open, it can't respond to any other stimulus no matter how strong. This is called the refractory period, and it's there to help prevent signals from traveling in both directions down the axon at once. So that is the surprisingly simple app that your nervous system uses to let you experience the world. And because the voltages in this process are always pretty much the same, the initial threshold around negative 55 millivolts and the peak depolarization at 40 millivolts, your neurons only communicate in a single monotone buzz. It doesn't matter if it's a spider on your knee or an elephant, a paper cut or a stab wound, the strength of that action potential is always the same. What does change is the frequency of the buzz. A weak stimulus tends to trigger less frequent action potentials, and that includes if the stimulus is coming from you, like your brain telling your muscles to perform some task. I mean, to do something delicate, like pick up an egg, the signal is low frequency. But a more intense signal, like trying to crush a can, increases the frequency of those action potentials to tell your muscles to contract harder, and the message turns into something that you can't ignore. Action potentials also vary by speed or conduction velocity. They're fastest in pathways that govern things like reflexes, for example, but they're slower in places like your glands, guts, and blood vessels. And the factor that affects a neuron's transmission speed the most is whether there's a myelin sheath on its axon. Axons coated in insulating myelin conduct impulses faster than non-myelinated ones, partly because instead of just triggering one channel at a time in a chain reaction, a current can effectively leap from one gap in the myelin to the next. These little gaps are the delightfully named Named nodes of Ranvier, and this kind of propagation is known as saltatory conduction, from the Latin word for leaping. But what happens when an action potential hits the end of its axon and is ready to do more than leap and jump all the way to another neuron? That you will find out next time. Today, you learned how your body is kind of like a big bag of batteries and how ion channels in your neurons regulate this electrochemistry to create an action potential from resting state to depolarization to repolarization and a brief bout of hyperpolarization. Thanks for watching, especially to all of our simple subscribers who make Crash Course possible for themselves and for everyone else. To find out how you can become a supporter, just go to subbable.com. This episode was written by Kathleen Yale. The script was edited by Blake DiVestino, and our consultant is Dr. Brandon Jackson. It was directed by Nicholas Jenkins and Michael Lavanda, and our graphics team is Vaughn Cafe. One more thing before you leave. We like Crash Course a lot, and we hope that you like Crash Course a lot, but I kind of feel like Crash Course is only useful for a certain segment of the population. Once you get to a certain age, then it's good, and then forever, it can be helpful to people. But younger people, not so much. And so, we are creating Crash Course Kids, hosted by Sabrina Cruz from Nerdy and Quirky. Crash Course Kids will start out focusing on fifth grade science, but we'll keep expanding to other topics as the channel grows. Sabrina will be talking about food chains and gravity and how the sun works and how plants eat and why flamingos are pink and many other topics. Oh, and another note, teachers, you can rest assured that we've got you covered. There will be info about the standards we've used to make sure that we're doing our very best to help you out. So if you are a teacher or you know a teacher or you know a child or you know someone who has a child or you've ever seen a child, you can tell them to go to com slash crash course kids and subscribe and you can go do that as well if you would find that kind of content useful or interesting.
I know I don't need to show all that last stuff, but like, you know, I'm a big fan of this channel. And so if I'm going to show their videos in class, I'm going to make sure that they're getting their proper advertising. All right. Uh, <laughs> so there was a lot, obviously he, I mean, but you didn't know somebody could talk faster than I do sometimes, but uh, <laughs> there's um, obviously a big breakdown of that action potential. But the big thing I want you guys to see when we're looking at that is when you are creating like this action potential, there's no such thing as a bigger action potential. All of these potentials are the same like electric charge. What triggers like a massive contraction, like if you're lifting super heavy for a deadlift versus like you um, picking up a pillow, like what gives those different like levels of strength and that way when you go to pick up that pillow, you don't fling it into the ceiling. What triggers that is how fast those action potentials are traveling and how frequently they occur. They're both the same electric charge, but one travels super fast like that, that's a heavy duty contraction. That's you lifting a barbell. And then something that's like this, kind of slower, that's you picking up your cat, you know? Um, and that way you don't fling your cat into the wall, <laughs> um, which we would never do, but it's always a, a horrible visual and so it's easy to remember. Uh, <laughs> so let's go ahead and take a look at these muscular contractions here, right? How do we actually trigger all this? Well, we do have neurotransmitters. Again, neurotransmitters are chemicals that trigger action potentials. They, they, they make that start to happen, right? So, um, we are going to look at, uh, uh, neurotransmitters are chemicals that trigger the uh, physiologic um, events, right? So you've got a lot of different neurotransmitters. You've got serotonin, dopamine, things like that. Um, they are what trigger like emotional responses to certain things. Uh, but the one that we are gonna primarily spend our time talking about is a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine uh, or ACH, okay? Nope, 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 it's a capital C. Um, Thanks for nothing. <laughs> so acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that when it is released from a neuron, so well, when it's released, released from a neuron, it triggers an action potential within a muscle. So when we see this neuron here, acetyl, like electricity is going to travel down the neuron. That neuron is then going to release acetylcholine. So when I have said in the past that the neuron zaps the muscle to get the muscle to do what it's supposed to do, I wasn't 100% telling the truth. That's not exactly what's happening. What's actually happening is the neuron is itself getting zapped by its own action potential. And that, when it gets to this neuromuscular junction, triggers the release of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine then binds with a muscle and that triggers the muscle to create its own action potential. Now the muscle is zapping itself. So yeah, I mean, if we basically break it down, your nervous system zaps your muscular system to make it do its work. But more specifically, your nervous system releases acetylcholine, which triggers muscular contractions. And that is what we refer, that's the neurotransmitter we're talking about. So acetylcholine is, uh, the, neur um, the neurotransmitter responsible for triggering muscular contractions, okay? Um, so uh, that increases like the release of sodium and potassium inside that individual muscle fiber. So more sodium will then move in, uh, then potassium is moving out, and what that does is that creates an electric potential, right? That creates that electric charge. So we're going to watch a video of how acetylcholine does this. Um, we're going to look at this uh, neurotransmitter moving across here. Nerve impulses, also known as action potentials, <laughs> travel from the brain or spinal cord. A little bit different uh, than our crash course videos here. Nerve impulses, also known as action potentials, travel from the brain or spinal cord to trigger the contraction of skeletal muscles. An action potential propagates down a motor neuron to a skeletal muscle fiber. 
The site where a motor neuron excites a skeletal muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. This junction is a chemical synapse consisting of the points of contact between the axon terminals of a motor neuron and the motor end plate of a skeletal muscle fiber. The events at the neuromuscular junction occur in seven coordinated steps. Step one, an action potential travels the length of the axon of a motor neuron to an axon terminal. Step two, voltage gated calcium channels open and calcium ions diffuse into the terminal. Step three, calcium entry causes synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine via exocytosis. Exocytosis is basically um, your cells pooping stuff out. <laughs> uh, it goes from being inside your cell to being outside your cell. That's exocytosis, it's exiting. Step four, acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to acetylcholine receptors, which contain ligand-gated cation channels. Step five, these ligand-gated cation channels open. Step six, sodium ions, shown here in red, enter the muscle fiber, and potassium ions, shown here in blue, exit the muscle fiber. The greater inward flux of sodium ions relative to the outward flux of potassium ions causes the membrane potential to become less negative. Step seven, once the membrane potential reaches a threshold value, an action potential propagates along the sarcolemma. Around, along the muscle. Neural transmission to a muscle fiber ceases when acetylcholine is removed from the synaptic cleft. This removal occurs in two ways. One, acetylcholine diffuses away from the synapse. Two, acetylcholine is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase to acetic acid and choline. Choline is then transported into the axon terminal for the resynthesis of acetylcholine. And that's one of the reasons why your muscles actually get tired. Um, sometimes you, if you do a lot of contractions in a row, uh, you are actually breaking down that neurotransmitter and your nervous system loses its ability to create new contractions. Uh, that happens when your, your muscle gets really, really acidic, which can be triggered by things like lactic acid. So it's not just uh, that lactic acid builds up and makes you tired because of how acidic it is. It actually keeps your nervous system from being able to interact with your muscular system. Okay, so um, you might be wondering at this point um, why we're going so in depth with some of this stuff. It's like, what the heck does this have to do with like me lifting like a dumbbell <laughs> or like a barbell? Like, what does this have to do with like actually training? Like all this big chemistry, all this big biology, right? What does this have to do with everything? Well. We gotta remember it like we have different ways that we train our clients. We train for different physiologic responses, right? Like if I wanna train somebody for power, I'm focusing on training their nervous system to do this as quickly as possible. So how are you gonna trigger somebody to you know, create as much power as possible? Well, I need to recruit as many motor units as I can. So we know that the greater number of motor units that I'm recruiting, the more I'm developing something for power or for maximal strength. But the less motor units I'm recruiting, my body will have plenty of energy to maybe pass off some of those motor units to maybe other muscle fibers. And so, you know, maybe they do a little bit of work and then they, you know, pass it off to somebody else. And so this gets to rest and this is done work and then maybe it goes back the other way. And I can only do that if I'm recruiting a small number of muscle fibers, right? Uh, and so there's a difference between high repetitions and low repetitions. There's a 
physical difference, right? Um, this is literally different in the number of neurotransmitters you're recruiting. It's different in the number of action potentials that you're generating. Like these require different types of fuel. They require different types of intensities. They require a different number of reps. They require different amounts of rest. All of that is due to you know, our understanding of all of this biology, right? All of this gives us an understanding of like why we chose what number of reps, why we chose how, what number of sets, what intensity, all that is directly related to this. Um, and then it also goes into our nutrition, right? Acetylcholine is made up of choline, which is one of your essential nutrients. Um, that is something that you need to consume in your diet, right? Um, so there is a, definitely a connection here. Like I, if this seems like we're going too in depth and it seems like this is not maybe related to what we're doing, it definitely is. You're not gonna be tested on most of this stuff. Like this is much more in depth than you get tested on, but having an understanding of it is what sort of writes the story behind like how all of this works. Like how do we get these reps? How do we get these sets? You could always just memorize sets and reps all day until the cows come home and that's fine. Um, but when you know like the reasoning behind it, it, it not only uh, gives you a greater understanding, but it also makes sure that you're less likely to kind of stray outside of those numbers that work, you know? Um, you're less likely to see something on the internet and be like, well, I'm gonna do it that way because that's trendy or cool looking, you know? We're gonna be effective trainers um, rather than just, I don't know, trainers. <laughs> uh, we don't wanna be that, that person who doesn't understand any of this. So, um, during a muscle contraction, kind of getting back to this, right? Uh, as acetylcholine will degrade, it produces like choline, which will then get recycled, right? Uh, gets in, broken down into like acetate and choline, and then your body can just, you know, reattach those things back together with the help of some enzymes. So what will happen is the end plate will depolarize, and that uh, that will cause uh, the muscle membrane to now have its own action potential. And it does this through this thing called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's that webbing that I was mentioning already, earlier, right? Um, if you look at, uh, oops, MLB bloopers, that is my, <laughs> that's what I was watching before I got on the call today. Uh, <laughs> we'll go ahead and close that. Um, oh, God dang it. Uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, out of here. Uh, you can see it's this webbing here, right? It's this webbing that kind of runs along. And then there's all those actin and myosin fibers, right? There's the, the sarcomere right there. And there's all the actin and myosin fibers. This webbing covers the whole thing. And that webbing is really what allows um, these other ions called calcium ions to kind of travel. So there it is interacting with uh, you know, the, the motor end plate there. That is that neuromuscular junction. So it zaps it, and then it travels along this webbing here, releasing all kinds of uh, different materials to create those contractions. Um, and then what's going to happen is calcium is actually going to release into the muscle cell, right? So uh, uh, So calcium... Uh, is actually, uh, which is going to be CA2, is uh, an important part of muscular contractions uh, because it is what binds to the troponin and tropomyosin to allow for muscular actions to occur by moving them out of the way. So calcium is actually uh, what is responsible for allowing muscular contractions to occur. Remember, troponin and tropomyosin during a relaxed muscle, they are blocking actin's binding sites, right? Um, actin and myosin can't get to each other and they can't squeeze together if troponin and tropomyosin are in the way. So calcium Thanks to, the, uh, thanks to the neurotransmitters releasing into the muscle and that triggering an action potential, right? Um, that releases calcium ions and those calcium ions are what kind of buy off those chaperones and they get them to move out of the way and now a muscular contraction can actually occur. Um, so that's a really big part of this as well. So um, if we're looking at like a muscular contraction, right? Um, 
Acetylcholine triggers an action potential. Actually, I should probably put that right. Um, triggers an action potential. And when an action potential gets triggered, that causes the release of calcium into the sarcomere. And the sarcomere now, because of all that calcium, moves tropinin and tropinomyosin out of the way, and actin is able to bind and create a concentric contraction, right? Um, so these are all really important, oh crap, these are all really important things that are happening, right? Um, now, let's go ahead and zoom out. Uh, let's get out of the let's get out of the chemistry here, uh, and let's zoom out and look at types of muscular contractions, right? Um, and I know we've kind of talked about this before, um, but obviously this is something that we do definitely use on the regular. So you have concentric contractions, okay? Concentric contractions uh, occur when a muscle is shortening, right? So this is when your muscle is developing tension. In fact, it's when it occurs when it's developing greater tension than a resistance. So if you've got a 10 pound dumbbell in, you, in your hand and you use uh, your muscle to generate 11 pounds of force, you're gonna overcome gravity and you're gonna concentrically shorten that muscle. Then we've got eccentric contractions as well. Um, eccentric contractions are exactly the opposite. They occur uh, when a muscle is lengthening, right? Uh, that occurs when a muscle is developing less tension than a resistance, right? So going back to like understanding all this stuff, right? If we're looking at like how our motor neurons are working, your motor neurons recruit like crazy to create concentric contractions. And then what they do is they release that, um, they release that tension in order to allow eccentric contractions to occur. So they'll recruit less and less and less fibers. So if you look at like how you're recruiting fibers, it's like you wanna overcome something. You go to grab that barbell, you recruit some fibers, your body's like, holy crap, that's not enough fibers. And then it recruits some more and it's like still not enough. And it recruits more and more and more and more. So you're creating more and more and more action potentials until finally you've got enough muscle fibers to uh, overcome that force, right? And then during an eccentric contraction, you're sort of unrolling it. You're going in the opposite direction, right? You recruit a few less, you recruit a few less until eventually you are, you know, setting that barbell back down. And that's what's occurring there. Uh, you've also got isometric contractions, which, uh, that's interesting. We're seeing isotonic. That's not right. Um, hold on. I need to fix that. Uh, There it is. Uh, isotonic are contractions that are occurring, like eccentric and concentric are the are isotonic contractions, by the way. Um, so isometric contractions occur when a muscle uh, is generating is staying at a constant length. So an isometric contraction is when your muscle is not recruiting any more muscle fibers, it's not recruiting any less muscle fibers, it's recruiting exactly the number that it needs to recruit in order to stay the same length, right? Um, when a muscle is developing equal tension to a resistance, okay? Um, so uh, those are our types of muscular contractions, right? Uh, all of your muscular, uh, all of your muscles can generate these type of contractions. Like every single muscle you've got can generate this type. However, uh, we do have different types of muscle fibers. Um, we have muscle fibers that are really good at producing tension over really extended periods of time. And we've got, you know, muscle fibers that are good at producing tension over short periods of time. And so this is where we look at muscle, our muscle fiber types, right? Um, and so you have your slow, you have your type one fibers, which are your slow twitch oxidative 
fibers, right? So all of this, everything we've been talking about today, right? Creating action potentials that takes ATP, um, you know, creating all these, these contractions, it takes a bunch of ATP, moving calcium in whatever direction it needs to go, that takes ATP. So there's a lot of energy needed in order to do this. So we're gonna define our muscle fiber types by how they look. Uh, if it has a lot of things that can produce energy on the go, we're going to consider that a type 1 fiber. And if it has less of those things, we're going to consider it a type 2 fiber. So type 1 fibers are your slow twitch, meaning they can't contract very quickly, therefore they cannot generate very much force. And they are oxidative fibers, meaning they can process oxygen really, really easily. Uh, they're really good at using aerobic metabolism. They're really good at like moving oxygen in order to produce ATP. So uh, these are uh, muscle fibers that have well-developed respiratory system, um, which have a well-developed <laughs> uh, respiratory system, which ensures the delivery of oxygen to the muscle fiber, okay? So these are uh, smaller in size. They gen generally tend to be smaller in size. Uh, they have more mitochondria. They have, they have greater uh, hemoglobin levels uh, and greater myoglobin levels, and they are used for long-term endurance type contractions, right? These are your muscle fibers that you are going to use to like hold a plank for two minutes, you know? Um, those are your type 1 muscle fibers. So they're designed to be able to produce ATP on the go constantly, right? Um, they are very much a associated with the cardiorespiratory system. You're gonna see greater levels of those enzymes that I talked about as well, right? Like those enzymes that allow you to better produce aerobic metabolism, you're gonna have more of that in type one fibers as well. So the energy making machinery, right, within this is able to break down and produce ATP super rapidly. Um, and so that's great, right? Like we're, we're really gr glad to be able to have that. But we've also got to have our, the opposite of that. We've got to have our fast twitch muscle fibers, right? So we have our type two fibers, which are your fast twitch fibers, right? And these are muscle fibers that have a higher um, calcium uh, level uh, and uh, more cellular volume. So these tend to be much larger in size. They have more calcium levels and therefore they're much, much better at generating like glycolysis, right? They're better at producing ATP in the fluid portion, right? Um, that is the liquid portion of the cell. These cells are literally larger. So there's more space in order to do that. You've got more fluid, you can produce more glycolysis, right? Um, but they also are going to have like greater concentrations of calcium ions due to their larger size. They're a big warehouse that can store a lot more calcium, you know? Um, so because of that, and because of their larger size, they're really good at producing these big long-term uh, contract, these, these, I'm sorry, not long-term, but big heavy duty contractions, right? Um, now this is going to be split into two subcategories. Uh, and this is where you have um, type 2A and type 2B, okay? So type 2A fibers um, are your, what we call fast twitch, because they are fast twitch, right? They're a type 2 fiber, but they are your oxidative glycolytic fibers. Um, type 2A fibers are... They're kind of like, I don't know, I mean, it, it seems like we should almost have, we should have just labeled these things as type one and type two and type three. Um, type three being super explosive and type one being endurance, but we didn't. We have type one and type two, and then type two has two A and two X. Um, two A fibers are still very much type one. They're, I mean, so they're still very much like a type two fiber, but they are somewhat good at endurance. 
right? Um, actually, you know what? I need to put all these little sub notes underneath here. Really quick, before we get into 2A, I apologize, I need to do this first. Uh, these are larger in size, uh, have less mitochondria, but have more cellular um, plasma or cytoplasm do um, uh, lower hemoglobin levels, uh, lower myoglobin levels, but more, uh, they have more actin and myosin proteins, right, due to their larger size, uh, and they are used for short-term powerful type contractions, right? These are used for your big heavy duty contractions. Um, now, type 2A fibers are kind of like in between, right? They have a medium amount of hemoglobin and a medium amount of myoglobin. They're pretty good at using oxygen, um, but they get exhausted much more quickly than type 1 fibers. So these are your intermediate muscle fibers, right? They're intermediate between type 1 and type 2. Um, people who have like a lot of type 2 A fibers are the ones who do really well in sports in particular, right? Because sports are like, you don't need to be the most powerful person in the world. You don't need to be the greatest endurance person in the world. You just need to be pretty good at everything, right? This is the jack of all trades fibers. Um, so they're fast twitch oxidative fibers. And again, they are typically associated with success in most sports. Uh, now, obviously, there's specialized sports. You know, like if you're a boxer, you want type 2A fibers, right? You want to be able to be on your feet for long periods of time and create powerful contractions. Um, but if you were to look at your fast twitch glycolytic fibers, which are not oxidative, right? So we're looking at type 2X fibers or type 2B fibers. We're going to put 2X because that's what's in your NASM textbook. Sometimes people refer to these as 2B. Um, uh, fibers. These are your fast twitch uh, glyco fiber, glycolytic fibers, right? So you've got your fast twitch oxidative fibers and you get your fast twitch glycolytic fibers. And the glycolytic fibers are like true fast twitch, right? They are super explosive, but they have a very, very, very low aerobic potential. Uh, have a very low, um, these are the true fast twitch fibers uh, used for extremely explosive contractions. And these are typically associated with uh, most power lifting related sports. So when you think of like power lifting, which is like as heavy as possible, you know, lift something as heavy as possible once. <laughs> That's your type 2X fiber, right? You ever, uh, <laughs> um, when you go to like a, you ever go to a, a, an arcade or something and they have that like boxing thing that you're supposed to hit one time and it shows you like, that's type 2X. <laughs> but like Dance Dance Revolution, where you're doing like lots of big powerful stuff, that's type 2. <laughs> Uh, and then, I don't know, walking around the arcade all day. That's type one. <laughs> um, my, my analogy broke halfway through that. That, that did not make, that was, that was weak sauce. All right. Uh, <laughs> so endurance training, right? That's very much associated with your type one fibers. That will trigger the conversion of type two fibers to type A, type, uh, type one fibers. And that's why uh, we kind of see difference between sprinter and marathoner. <laughs> uh, if you look here, there is definitely like a body difference here, <laughs> right? We are seeing a big difference between like power related runners versus like marathon related runners. Um, you know, that large size gives you a lot of like cellular plasm, which is really great because that's gonna allow you to produce like big powerful contractions, but you're gonna get exhausted much, much more quickly because the type of metabolism you're primarily relying on produces lactic acid as a byproduct. Whereas this type of fiber 
you know, the byproduct is going to be carbon dioxide, which you can just get rid of. You can just exhale it. So this is really great if you want to be on the run for long periods of time. This is really great if you want to create like big explosive contractions. And I know like we're only looking at runners here, but this is also going to occur, you know, when in the ways that we lift weights, you know, if you're doing big uh, amounts of repetitions, you're going to develop more type one fibers. And if you're doing low amounts of repetitions, you're going to produce more type two fibers. Um, but we also have to look at how we are training our nervous system, right? So like if I want to train my nervous system to create signals that control a whole bunch of muscle fibers simultaneously, I need to do something for long periods of time so that I give my brain enough time to learn how to do those movements, right? So like, let's say I'm doing a high number of repetitions where I'm standing on one leg, right? If I'm doing like bicep curls like this, I've got all these little like micro contractions that I'm creating, right? That's developing my type one fibers and it's training my nervous system to know like what it needs to recruit to keep me nice and stable. But then if I move to like a super stable environment, where I've got a big, big heavy weight and I'm only doing like a few repetitions, like really, and I'm trying to move as fast as I can. I'm like, come on, and I drop it, right? And I'm like really working to work as hard and powerfully as I can. Now I'm teaching my nervous system how to recruit a whole bunch of motor units in a very stable environment only a few times, right? I need to produce a bunch of ATP, get a big explosive contraction, and then I can rest. And then, now I can't use bicep curls anymore. Uh, let's say I want to go for a completely like super powerful contraction. Maybe I've got a medicine ball here. I'm going to train my nervous system to recruit as hard as it can. And then I'm going to explode. And then I'm going to get it right back in the other direction, right? Then I'm probably going to do a fast eccentric and concentric, right? I'll get that medicine ball. And rather than just like catching it and then exploding and then like catching it and exploding, I'm actually going to train my nervous system by using both directions as fast as possible. So rather than do that version where I caught it kind of slow, threw it really fast, I'm gonna go fast in both directions. I'm gonna get that ball, I'm gonna go in and back out. That is going to make me much more explosive. Now I'm training my nervous system how to produce action potentials even faster. That's why we have to look at like the different types of muscle fibers. So that last version, the, the explosive pass, that's a type 2X fiber. The super heavy fibers is a type 2A fiber. And the standing on one leg doing bicep curls, that's very much a type 1 fiber. Uh, so you're going to have, uh, and, and that's what we're seeing here. Endurance training is going to convert the trigger. Uh, it's going to convert type 2A from type 2 to type 2B. So it's always helpful to like, you know, go to the gym, do some max strength lifting, develop your maximum strength. And then afterwards you can convert that into like more endurance. And so it's like your one rep max becomes your two rep max. And then it becomes your three rep max until eventually it's like, that used to be my one rep max. Now I can do like 15 repetitions. Then you go and you just switch it over again, right? You're back to like lifting even heavier weight and you slowly convert it over time. Your body goes, all right, I know that I know how to do this nervous system wise. Now I just need to get the energy source in order to be able to do it. I need to change my, my, my energy system. And uh, that's it guys. Really, really technical day today, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but remember, like I said, all that kind of stuff, it is very technical, but that's not the stuff you're going to be like tested on. That's all. That's why it's on day five, by the way, because <laughs> um, day five stuff bar barely shows in up in your midterm. Because um, most of your midterm is based on days one through four, but a little bit on today. Um, like you'll see like muscle fiber types and stuff like that. It'll be mentioned, but um, mm -hmm. obviously this is a, a really, really like you know, uh, biology, like real small microscopic data. And when you can't see these moving parts, it always makes it a little hard to understand. But now you kind of see the story behind like why we have these specific rules that we follow repetition wise, uh, sets wise, rest wise, rest is really important, right? Um, we barely even dove into that today, but we're going to look at it a lot in, in the second half of class because like you don't give yourself enough rest. You can't convert all that lactic acid into ATP and you can't lift, you know, um, plus you leave that super high acidic environment. So you now can't produce more acetylcholine either. Um, mm -hmm. So rest, 
hugely important because sometimes people are like, yeah, I get like 90% of my ATP back after 60 seconds, but I gotta wait three minutes to get to a full 100%. Why the heck? It doesn't take two more minutes to get 10%, you know? Um, and it's like the reason that gets so much larger is because like it isn't just like your ATP, it's also like, you know, um, acetylcholine and things like that. It's other neurotransmitters that you are are kind of waiting on. Um, and that is that, that, like I said, that's it guys. Uh, how you feeling? Any questions? Mm. Erica, we got you. Was it two days in a row or am I, it was a couple days ago. <laughs> two days. I missed yesterday. Ah, well still cool stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got our last, we got our, our midterm tomorrow. We'll play a review game and obviously I'll do a review video like we always do. Um, and then we have Friday off, so that'll kind of close out the week, and then we'll be back for the second half of this class um, uh, after that. Um, I want to do a cardio day. Uh, I want to do, like, a cardio day next week. I wanted to, I was thinking about doing it this Friday, like, this Friday, but number one, we have school off, so I can't do that. <laughs> and number two, it's, like, the 4th of July weekend, so I don't know if people are, I mean, <laughs> it's not like many people are traveling. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I just realized that. I literally made that, I literally like considered that. Now I'm realizing how silly that was. Uh, <laughs> um, so, Brad, yeah. Um, I want to go to Sochi today and I want to print out the notes up until today for this section. But um, I was going to wait until after you were done um, because I know you take some time now to like, um, like edit and upload stuff. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to like give you that like pressure at all. So don't worry at all, because I literally am like just at home. <laughs> so no I, what, which oh, you want the you want the last like today and like the these five days of notes? Yes. Cool. Yep. I'll um mm -hmm. I'll send it to you in a in a file, and then you can take it down to social. Uh, if, do you have a flash drive with you? Uh, I did, but I haven't used it, and so I don't know if I still have it because I probably mm, I have to look. But okay, is well, it possible to do it via email, like to just? Um, yeah, it'll be in your email, and then you can you can pick it up. It'll it'll be a little easier um, if you've got the drive, just because then you can just plug it in and print like that. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you can they'll always, they'll let you use your email and stuff. So I will email you all five uh, today of the notes um, mm -hmm. and like a PDF form because those are a little easier to transport. And then mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you'll you'll have it and you can print it out down there. Sweet. And then um, I was wondering if I can just pick up like any other book that I may need for the future, if that's possible at all, because yeah. And I mean, I never got shirts, but at this point I'm like, <laughs> that's insane. Uh, <laughs> that is an insane sentence. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I can't think of it. Yeah. I mean, obviously we have the books. If you haven't picked up like any of your books, they're, they're down there waiting for you. Um, mm -hmm. You, the guy you're going to want to talk to is Victor. Um, Victor okay. Victor's the book guy. The um, tall guy, yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So so find him and, uh, well, just ask the front desk and they'll they'll direct you towards him and then, you know, he'll hand you your books and anything that you need. Okay, cool. Thank cool, cool. you, bro. Yeah, of course. All right, guys. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. <laughs>